Welcome to Mrs. A B Literature. Um, today we're looking at actually at a non-fiction text um, for on the syllabus for the language and literature A level um, for AQA um, based on the Paris anthology. Uh, today we'll be looking at the text entitled Mile by Mile, Mile can't even say that, um, which is on page 12 of your Paris anthology. Uh, so before you start uh, this lesson, you will need your Paris anthology with you so that you can refer to it and annotate in it as we go. Um, today we are going to be looking at mode. We're going to be thinking about the spectrum of mode, whether this is a written and a spoken text. We're going to be looking at writer's perspective and basically just doing a, an annotation of the text. Uh, we should also get some time to compare... Uh, this text to the Stories Are Waiting text, um, which is the uh, first text in your pack, in your anthology, on page 11. It might be worth stopping the tutorial at this point just to um, take some time to reread re that Stories Are Waiting text. Okay. So, here is a picture of the Gare du Nord in Paris. The text that we're about to study um, relates in part uh, to this station here. Uh, it's not unlike, I guess, the architecture of some of our quite grand stations in London, where um, you know the architecture actually is much better than sort of standing around on the on the platforms waiting for the train um, why is it grand uh, maybe just spend a moment making some notes about why people why architects would have actually uh, produced uh, station frontages like this that are really really very grand and very um, ornate um, you can also obviously think about the Lon London stations that do the same so St Pancras is probably the obvious choice um, but there are a number of other uh, rather beautiful uh, London stations as well. Why, why make a place where you're just getting on and off a train, why make it so grand? OK, just stop the tutorial there and have a think, make some notes. OK. Now, in what ways does this text um, convey similar ideas about the journey to Paris um, in, compared to sort of stories are waiting? Um, and how does it represent the experiences you can then have in Paris? Uh, we will be looking at these questions in a little bit more detail later. Um, and in a moment, I'll give you a chance to read the text yourself to just have a think about this. What, what, how is it representing the idea of a journey? the idea of getting someplace and what you might do when you get there. If you remember about Stories Are Waiting, the, the whole text was, um, I mean, it's quite short, uh, links to the idea that um, uh, the, the journey to um, uh, Paris is only the start. Um, obviously, this is a Eurostar advert, the, the Stories Are Waiting, and that um, what you'll be getting there is, is something that... It, shows great promise we don't know what that is yet um, but the the whole point of selling Eurostar is to actually um, sell that experience so are we actually talking about this as a station or are we, are we talking about something that's a lot bigger than that a, that's a lot more significant than that again uh, questions that we will be asking as we go through this lesson so um, what I'd like you to do now is just take a few moments to uh, read. Um, I call it Le, the, the Gare du Nord text. It's actually called Mile by Mile, um, the Gare du Nord. Um, it's about the journey from London to Paris. Um, and it's written by R. Piggott and M. Thompson. Uh, so if I could just get used to spend a few minutes to read that, and that's all of it, so it's from page 12 through to page 15 um, and also look at the contextualizations at the front of your anthology uh, again just stop the tutorial um, when you've finished reading you can continue all 
All right, as you've read that, I'm hoping that you would see that this is what we call a landmark station. Um, what do we think we mean by that? What are the connotations of the name as well of the, of the um, station? So what is a landmark station? Uh, again, add to your notes on this. And what are the connotations of the name? Le Gare du Nord, uh, translated into English, sorry about my French accent, um, it translated into, into English means the uh, station of the north. Um, how does that kind of increase its significance? Again, just uh, stop the tutorial, uh, spend a minute just writing down your notes on that. All right, now you should have read those contextualizations. Um, if you haven't, go back to those now. Uh, what we're looking at here is, is obviously that all-important context, that AO3, uh, marked uh, under f for 15 marks in this question. So um, it's you, you need to be considering it. Uh, so a couple of things there. If I, I would like you to now just um, focus on the gap, Tim, of the text, the genre, audience, purpose, provenance and background, time frames and the mode. And where, where you're thinking about the mode, don't just assume this is just a written text. Is it a hybrid? Can we argue that there is there are elements of spoken language in this text? Uh, what's the mode of reception and the chat or the channel of reception as well? So the modality of this text. Um, and just have a think about that. Again, just stop the tutorial um, and make some notes and then come back to that, um, come back to it and restart it when you're ready. Okay, I think some things to discuss here on, on the genre is it's, it's quite odd. It's not one that we've come across before. Um, it is in the contextualizations. Um, they say it's a, an account of or outlines the routes taken by the Golden Arrow train service that ran on from both sides of the English Channel uh, from London to Dover and then from Calais to Paris between 1926 and 1971. So that was the train service that people used to catch uh, with the gap in between for the Channel crossing up until 1971. Uh, the current Eurostar service um, has been linked um, has been linking the two countries. Um, between uh, UK and France, I suppose, but also um, we can get the train from St Pancras and go all the way through to Paris um, since 1994. Um, the, it's worth making a note of the two um, authors. Um, Piggott is a cartographer, which means that he's a map maker, so he will have been responsible for doing the maps in this section. And Thompson is a researcher at the National Railway Museum in York, um, so he, he, they're both specialists, they're both enthusiasts. Um, will they have a big sort of audience following? No, not in the same way that somebody like Bill Bryson does, for example, um, or somebody like Ernest Hemingway. So what you're looking at here is, is people who are interested in journeys, people who are interested in the history of transport, um, and potentially people that have visited the National Railway, Railway Museum in York. Um, uh, also people, I guess, who are interested in the sort of the history of uh, Europe as well might be interested in this. Um, but there is a lot more to the text. It's not just a history book. Um, it, it, it plays about with the genres, as we'll see later on. Um, so the genre here at the moment is probably just sort of an informational um, book. Um, it is taken from um, a sort of a, a book um, and you can actually access that book on um, the internet. Um, the, it says in the contextualizations the maps produced by Reginald Piggott in this text mirror the carto cartographic, I'll say that word, method used by S.N. Pike in his book Mile by Mile on Britain's Railways, which was published in 1947. So there is a method here in the way that they are using the maps and the, the routes and how they, they kind of um, visualize, use graphology to um, show the routes there. OK, moving swiftly on, let's look at the opening. So on the PowerPoint slide now, uh, you've got the opening of um, the text. 
Uh, again, you can find that in the anthology. Um, I, what I want to do is just to explore some of the language features that are going on in this opening. So they say, the writers say, the ultimate destination of both Golden Arrow and the Eurostar is the beautiful city of Paris. However, in reality, the first place that the traveller by rail from London really encounters is the Gare du Nord. It is from this station that the tourist, businessman or lover sets out to explore the city and, like its counterparts in London, it has a long and interesting history. OK, so uh, as an introduction, it, it, it's, um, it, it whets your appetite a little bit. It, it's talking about, it's telling you that it's talking about the history of the Gare du Nord, um, but also the, the idea of the, the travel between London um, and Paris. Um, these are, this is the first of, there's a, not the first, the, a few, there are a few texts in the Paris anthology that actually don't look at Paris in that much detail. What they do is they look at the journey to and from. Um, and this is an important theme. Uh, we, we have, um, the obvious ones is the, uh, uh, as I said, is the stories are waiting, but we've also got one from Sophia, a very short narrative, uh, spoken language narrative from Sophia, um, who, oh, or is it Zara? No, it's Zara, who talks about um, going to, um, you know, being on the train. Um, okay, so stop the um, PowerPoint here, um, but before you do, what I'd like you to do is to pick out um, examples of these language features. So categoric reference, adjectives, verbs, uh, th there is a triplet, so look at that, and formal register and low frequency lexis. What I'd like you to do is to think about, pick them out and then think about what is the effect of these or what has, why has the writer chosen to use these particular language features. At this point, you'll probably be thinking, well, although this is not a piece of um, some, well, what can I say? It has got a semantic density to it. It's not a, um, you know, spontaneous text by any means. It has been crafted, it has been edited, and it will have been sort of, um, you know, in terms of the language, there would have been a reasonable amount of thought gone into the crafting of the language features. So what we're after here is to look at um, how the, does the writer use these language features and what is the effect of them? What do you think is the desired effect? Bearing in mind we've got a target audience probably of sort of railway um, or travel enthusiasts. Okay, so stop the PowerPoint at this point, um, make some notes and then continue when you're ready. Okay, I've done a little summary here. So the cataphoric reference, it starts off the ultimate destination. We don't know what that destination is. So it's referring forward to something, but we don't know what it is. We then get um, of both the Golden Arrow and of the Eurostar is, and then we get the beautiful city of Paris. So um, there is cataphoric reference referring forward to, um, to Paris from the ultimate destination. Then we get another cataphoric reference in the first place that the traveller by rail from London really sees or encounters. So we've got, again, the first place. We don't know what that is, and then it builds up to the Gare du Nord. Um, the effect of that um, is to build a, an element of suspense, um, almost like a drum roll to these these two places, um, to, to make them seem that they are worth visiting, that they're worth going to. Um, so it's sort of building up that expectation in the reader. Uh, we see a little bit more of this later on in the map when we look at the um, sort of the captions to the maps. Um, adjectives, we've got, I think there's three, so I've grouped those together. We've got beautiful, long and interesting as there's sort of the double adjective there um, with the conjunction. Again, suggesting a, a particular representation of um, the journey to Paris. It's not just Paris that's be that is beautiful, but it's also the idea of long and interesting history. So we've got this combination of the two, the idea that Paris is exciting and a wonderful place to go to, um, but also so is the travel to it. Um, we link that again to, if we then link that to the verbs, 
we see we've got a semantic field of um, encounters, of discovery, of experience, um, all suggesting in the semantic field of sort of explorers. So encounters, sets out and to explore. Really, really clear there. Um, the list of three triplets, we've, uh, you've probably seen that quite easily. Tourist, businessman or lover. Um, picks up on, on the sorts of people that would be travelling to Paris. And maybe a hint here as well as a, as a sort of a secondary audience to this text is that, you know, anybody that's travelling to Paris might be interested in reading this, whether you're a tourist, businessman or lover. Interestingly, um, this text um, is, is actually assuming it's a businessman. There is a, a, a hint of a sort of sexist language in that, in that reference there. And then finally, um, this does have a formal register um, with some low frequency Lexis, so um, counterparts in London. Um, but on the whole, um, the, the Lexis here is, is accessible uh, to most. Uh, you'll see as you read on, there are some elements of low frequency Lexis. The assumption here is that the people reading this um, will be of a, a reasonable level of education and learning so that they're able to access this the, the, the Lexis that's used here. Okay, so I'm just going to move on. All right, now what I'd like you to do is just jot down this essay question. Um, we just we should always have this in mind that when you when you're answering this uh, this question in the exam, you will be asked to compare two texts together. Uh, so we're looking at these two texts at the beginning of the anthology. Stories are waiting in Paris. The Eurostar advert and um, Mal by Mal or the Guardian Law. Um, and what the, in the exam board, obviously in the exam paper, I've not done it on the PowerPoint, but they will print these texts for you. Um, this one, I'd like you to take it from line, um, the line that says the next major overhaul, which is on page 12. Uh, it's on the second column, the third par starting third paragraph down. Um, to the um, really to the end of page 14 so um, it's to the yeah so it's looking at um, taking into account one of those maps um, although I will be um, looking at the maps on the uh, on the flesh door or the golden arrow uh, which is the older um, the older section um, and the older transport OK, you will be told to refer to both texts in your answer. There will be a focus on representation. In this case, the representation is of the promises and experiences um, in, in travelling to Paris. So it will be um, for the A-level, the AS tends to be less specific, but for the A-level, um, the question can be quite specific to the texts. Um, you should refer to both texts in your answer. And then, as usual, I've got my yellow step-by-step -step guide here, and I've just put them all on this PowerPoint. So, again, you may want to stop the, um, the tutorial at this point just to make a note of those three steps. We've actually done quite a lot of this. Um, so highlight the keywords in the question. We've gapped in what we can. You may be able to add to that as you've been reading. Um, try and um, read as much as you can into that context and think about some of those contextual um, concepts that we talk about that we've learnt for the Paris Anthology um, and then finally read and annotate both texts. Now what we're going to be doing in the next few minutes is just doing, we've done the reading but doing some annotations of it. Okay so when you're ready restart the tutorial. Okay so what I want to do now is just um, spend some time comparing the narrative perspective between these two texts. So um, you will need stories are waiting with you. Um, I want you to think about not just the obvious, um, but what is the narrative perspective? See if you can get three points per text. Obviously, um, you can take this now because we're looking at the exam question from where uh, in the Gare du Nord text from the, the next major overhaul, that section. Um, but you can have a look at the rest of it as well if you want to. Um, so what is the narrative perspective? What are their thoughts on Paris? What point of view comes across? And are there any differences and similarities? And also you should be able to link it to the provenance, especially important with the Stories Are Waiting text, because obviously that is a corporate 
um, producer. So that is um, from the Eurostar themselves. So there will be a particular line of thinking um, and a perspective that the narrator has to actually present. OK, so stop the tutorial for a moment, um, make some points and then we'll move on. OK, so we're now going to look at a section um, that just the, uh, the section that we're looking at in the essay question bit by bit. So um, we're going to start with um, looking at um, the Gare du Nord as a destination of the Eurostar from the first part of the e the extract that's given in the exam question. So. Um, again, I'll just read it to you. The next major overhaul of the station came about as a result of the Eurostar itself. Tracks and platforms were altered once again to accommodate the new high-speed line. The Eurostar speeds into Paris, having passed through Lille, only a short distance from the station frontage that used to grace the Gare du Nord when it first opened over 160 years ago. OK, so what I'd like you to do is just think now about that very short section, remembering that, um, again, both texts, uh, Stories Are Waiting and this one, Focus on Eurostar, um, that um, you look at the connotations of Eurostar as a brand name and to the representations of um, Paris as an experience and then comment on the use of the language to connote speed and technical advancement. What is the effect of the adverbial phrase at the end of the segment? OK, in other words, that's the over um, when it first opened over 160 years ago. OK, so again, just spend a few moments on that, just getting your thoughts together about what the connotations of Eurostar are. OK, moving on. Um, just a, really a couple of quotations here from that section. Um, the first one, one traveller arriving in Paris on the Golden Arrow, described seeing the station as, as he neared his journey's end as nothing more than a black dome. Now, remembering, obviously, they, they, they've gone back in history here. So this is just after the bit we've just looked at um, when it opened 160 years ago. So we are looking probably you know, um, at a time when technology wasn't as good as it, as it is now. Um, but he described it as a black dome. OK, um, I want you to, again, in a moment, just stop the tutorial and think about what the effect of describing the station as nothing more than a black dome is. Um, and then secondly, uh, again, in the, uh, right at the bottom of page 12, it says its massive train shed certainly seems to swallow up with apparent ease all the trains that terminate there. But it is also more than just a station. It carries with it the symbols of the far-flung cities it joins together and stands for the connections which the railways made possible. So there's a sense of kind of celebration in this second bit, um, thinking a, a sense of awe, um, as in A-W-E, um, how does that writer here convey a sense of the station's size and status? Think about what they're promising. If you go back to the stories are waiting text, um, you know, it's all about promise. You know, you may go here, you may go there, maybe you'll do this. Um, do we get the same sense with this text? OK, again, just stop the tutorial, take some notes on that um, and then you can continue when you're ready. OK, so we're going to move on now, um, just for the moment, to have a look at the maps um, and the text boxes. Um, the exam question focuses on, on page 14, but as I said to you earlier, I will probably be looking at page 15 as well. Um, but really, first of all, what is the point of these two pages? Um, you know, identify three techniques, their effect, and annotate your ideas. OK, so again, just stop the tutorial there. Uh, and take some notes on that, just on page 14 and 15. OK, so I've done a little bit of a commentary here. I've picked three focuses. Um, the first is on mode of delivery, the second on genre, and the third on semantics. So I've written, this could be completely different to what you've done, and it actually doesn't matter. 
Um, so the mode of delivery changes somewhat here. So this is from the previous bit, which was obviously the kind of the historical bit about the text, about the, um, the station. Now we're looking at the mode of delivery changing. Um, so if you look at the first bit, it says the city of Paris is all around us and the train and the train travelling more slowly now passes through the communes of Aubervilliers to the left and Saint-Ouen on the right before pulling into the platform at the Gare du Nord. So we, we've got here a different sense. It feels, it feels different as a text. So we have um, previously a, a highly written f form of mode. Um, but it actually gives way to more colloquial features in these sections. Um, it's aiming to make you feel as though you're on board the different trains and that you're going on a tour with the, the writers. Um, so, again, the idea of uh, in the second box on page 14 uh, for Eurostar, uh, it says, we now enter the suburbs um, of Paris, First, coming through the commune of Stain, of Stain, I would presume, before entering Pierre Fête sur Seine. So again, here you've got the idea of you're you're actually experiencing that journey with the writers. Um, it introduces that inclusive first person pronoun we, um, which includes the reader and the and the writer on the tour. It it feels like it, instead of just a history book now, it feels like a guided tour. Um, we then get a genre shift then, don't we? Because um, whereas before it was perhaps a historical account, um, you know, a writing to explain um, type purpose, here it becomes a hybrid. Um, again, as the train rounds the corner, this is from the flesh door section on the, um, on the other page. Um, you, flesh door meaning the golden arrow um, in French. So um, it says, as the train rounds the corner, the Seine can be seen for the first time. Um, the use of the subordinate clause here presents a travel guide format. It, it, it assumes the reader is inexperienced um, and the reader is being encouraged to take the journey with them. Um, again, the idea here that um, you know, you're going back in time as a reader because this is uh, uh, the flesh door. Um, which is the previous train and, and the, you can see the routes, the, the um, maps actually give you the routes that they take to get through into Paris. Um, there's a sense of excitement, there's a sense of um, you know, anticipation about these journeys. And then finally, the semantics will both engage with the cliches of travelling to Paris um, so both sections, but we're now here. We we see this is um, in the first box on page fourteen uh, for Eurostar. It says we have now arrived in the heart of the city of light. All of Paris is before us now. So the galleries, the museums, boulevards, and restaurants. Um, so this is it engages with those cliches, the stereotype of, um, well, what is Paris? Paris is the city of light. Um, and we've looked before at the sort of connotations and the history of that moniker um, that Paris is given. Um, and all of Paris is before us now. The idea of the, the, the excitement, um, the, um, the anticipation of what is promised. Again, very, very similar two stories are waiting but here they list it galleries museums boulevard and restaurants so here we've got the four a listing in a, a list of four um building up to sort of the idea of the restaurants but all of these are cliched stereotypical things that tourists would want to go and see in the city it's what it's famous for okay so i've mentioned mode earlier on um, how can we call this text a hybrid? Now, if you'll remember, I, I quite often like these kind of continuum sliding scales. And way back in year 12, we looked at the idea of where a serial packet might sit. And I placed it on the written side of things and encouraged you to actually argue whether it was the case or not. And most of you actually said it wasn't all written, that actually there were elements of spoken language in the written form on the, the side of the serial box, things that sh um, show engagement with the reader, for example, 
um, you know, sort of encouragement to enter a competition or find a, you know, a free gift inside if it's for children. Um, so traditional boundaries between speech and writing um, have changed as a, re as a result of new technology. We've seen that with the TripAdvisor text um, and the uh, GransNet text as two that are really heavily influenced by technology. This one less so, but we still have this element. There is an element of spoken language in this text, I think. So could you have a look at this text, and so that's just the Gardu Nor, not the stories are waiting, and think where does it sit on our sliding scale? Where would you put it? Is it closer to spoken? Is it closer to written? And then what I'd like you to do is to give an example of, from the text of why you think you've placed it where you have. Okay, again, you'll need to stop the tutorial just for a moment to do that and then move on when you're ready. Okay, we're back to the metaphor. So how can metaphors be more abstract? We've talked about this before. We've looked at the idea of journey being something that is not just physical. And here we've got two texts, mile by mile, and also the stories are waiting. Two texts here that show really clearly this abstract metaphor, this idea that the journey isn't just about physically getting on a train and getting somewhere that actually the journey itself can be part of the experience. Okay, so what I want you to do is to find evidence of that in those two texts. So now look at Stories Are Waiting. It should be really easy for you for Stories Are Waiting, um, but also through the mile by mile, just from the, you can just do it from the section that um, the exam question has, has highlighted. Um, so that is from the next major overhaul. Um, and have a look to see if you can find evidence of this double metaphor, this more abstract metaphor. Again, stop the tutorial and restart when you're ready to go. So a little bit of theory now. Lakoff and, Jeff, uh, and Johnson, uh, not the same as Robin Lakoff. So don't get that muddled up. If, you, if you're worried, just use the surnames in the exam. So Lakoff and Johnson. Uh, wrote a book in 2003 called Metaphors We Live By. Um, and in it, they argued that the idea of metaphor is not is much, much bigger than just a language kind of creative feature to, you know, sort of create a particular effect. A metaphor is something that runs through our lives. It's much bigger than that. We think in metaphors. We, we associate our lives and what our experiences with metaphors. So every day, our experiences are linked to metaphor. So we think in that metaphor and our language is shaped by it. So for example, travel is obviously a physical journey, but it's also that emotional experience. And actually it's that emotional experience that makes the metaphor all the stronger and all the more kind of, in some respects, poignant or evocative. So metaphor is not just uh, in the words we say, but it's in our shared cultural understanding um, that, you know, when we journey, the whole idea of travel, especially in a modern society where travel actually um, is, you know, it's encouraged. It's encouraged as a, as a point of, um, you know, social and emotional development, um, something that actually is, is a tradition so um, wealthy, usually men, uh, used to take that grand tour um, where, you know, they would go and they would experience the world. And it wasn't just about seeing different cultures. It was about finding themselves and journeying emotionally. Um, and we actually often, these metaphors, we, we, we take them and we accept them when we read. We don't think about oh yeah that's a metaphor and I you know it's, it's something that we accept because it's culturally it's something that we're used to um, so we can argue metaphor is a concept rather than just a language technique um, and we often see these metaphors through a particular choice of semantic fields in writing um, so uh, we have talked about this before this is a nice theory to add to that so uh, again just stop the tutorial and make some notes if you would like to um, before moving on.
So, our text, mile by mile, and the double metaphor. Um, what I'd like you to do now is to reread the following lines from the text. In what ways can they be seen as a double metaphor? Uh, you've got them here in front of you. You don't need to read any more than that, but if you wanted to refer in the text to it, it is on it starts on page 12 towards the bottom. Uh, that should say one traveller. That's Sorry, that's an error. <laughs> uh, one traveller arriving in Paris on the Golden Arrow describes seeing the station as nothing more than a black dome. So we've seen that before. Um, and then the next bit is, um, it's more than just a station, is on page 13. It's more than just a station. It carries with it the symbols of the far-flung cities it joins together and stands for the connections which the railways made possible. While it is a terminus, one of the six major termini of the city, it is also a gateway. A gateway not only to the city, but also to the continent beyond it. Okay, so if you could now stop the tutorial again um, and think about the words in those two quotations, in what ways can they be seen as a double metaphor? All right, I think it's quite useful to, um, to just recap and revise that idea of the abstract metaphor from these two texts because it works so well. Um, there are so many other texts it does work for and we've, we've covered some, some of the, uh, uh, the sort of um, self-experience and self-discovery texts that we see later on in the anthology also really work well with this idea of the double metaphor. Uh, that journey is not just physical, it's experience as well. So people like the uh, Fraser Cavassoni text, The Breathless in Paris, absolutely. Um, the To a certain extent, the Bill Bryson. Um, all of these, the idea that, you know, sometimes experiences can be bad. So, for example, in the Hemingway or in the Bill Bryson. Um, but there's still experience and it still adds to the richness of your own sort of experience and emotional development. So we've done these three texts kind of in a convoluted way um, in the yellow boxes. So what I'd like you to do now is, um, we're just coming to the end of the tutorial now, is to complete a detailed plan for an essay on these two texts, remembering what you need to include. So the AOs are AO1, AO3 and AO4. So there's no AO2 in this question. So AO1 is your language levels, picking those and analysing the language features. Um, AO3 is your context. Both of these are marked on 15 marks. Remembering that context needs to cover both genre and context of production, context of reception, as well as the mode of the text. You must include those three in, in your answers. And then finally, the AO4 is those connections between them. But part of that AO4, a big part of that AO4, is, is being able to comment on how Paris is represented or how the kind of, in this case, in the question, its promises and experiences are represented, um, needs to come out. And that's where you'll be marked for answering that part of the question. OK, so um, I think that's about it. Um, just spend about sort of 15 minutes at the end of this tutorial planning that essay. Uh, if you wanted to go on and have a go at writing it, then feel free and you can get that to me uh, to be marked.